Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Ashley, and if you're new here, we like to talk about stuff like the paranormal, unsolved mysteries, and of course, true crime. Now, in today's video, we're going to talk about a story that involves a bit of both, a bit of unsolved mystery and a bit of paranormal as well. Now, before we get into today's video, of course, just want to send you guys a quick reminder to please comment, like, subscribe if you enjoy this type of content. I post once a week and right now my schedule is every Friday. So like I was saying earlier, today's story is going to be about the tragic crash of flight 401 from Eastern Airlines. Now this was quite a while ago. This took place in the early 70s. So I don't think a lot of you will be super familiar with this story. So with that being said, let's get into the video. So it was Christmas 1972 and passengers and crew were all on board flight 401 from Eastern Airlines. That day they were making a relatively short journey from New York to Florida, Miami, which is usually about three, three and a half hours, maybe four, depending on, you know, the external circumstances. So this flight is quite popular. A lot of airlines run this flight. I've gone on this flight multiple times and, you know, it's such a common flight that a lot of people just don't think that it's not going to happen. It's just so normal to people that they kind of take it for granted that sometimes things happen and that's exactly what happened on this flight. Flight 401 would never make it to Miami. At the time in 1972, it was actually the worst airplane crash recorded in American history. However, it doesn't just end with the story of the crash. In the end, it actually ended up creating quite a lot of ghost stories that till till this day remain unexplained. So like I was saying earlier, flight 401 from Eastern Airlines was taking off on December 29th. It actually ended up being an L1011 from Lockheed. And as a common nickname, it was often called a whisper liner because the engines would rarely make any noise. It had been cleared for takeoff from 9 p.m. from JFK Airport en route to Miami. And the captains that day were Captain Robert Loft and his co-pilot, Albert John Stockstill. Also on board were several other crew and cabin members, including Don Repo as an engineer and second officer, maintenance specialist, Angelo Donato, and Warren Terry, who was off duty at that time, but he was actually just catching a flight to Miami after completing some work assignments. The manifest listed 153 people on board, but in reality, there was actually 160 people. This included all of the crew as well, including 25-year-old Beverly Raposa and her colleague Mercedes Ruiz. The flight was quite uneventful. Nothing out of the ordinary happened on their way down to Miami. And they had actually crossed the Palmetto Expressway as it crossed over West Palm Beach over to Miami. And they were actually so close to landing that the pilot had actually made his announcement right before landing. You know, the message where the pilot comes in and he tells you what the weather is like at the destination and he thanks everyone for flying on the airline. So that had given everybody a sense of comfort that, you know, they had made it to their destination safely. However, just before 11.40 p.m. is when the troubles began inside the cockpit. Co-pilot Albert Stockstill had expressed his concern because there was a certain light that still hadn't gone off. And this light actually, its only job was to show the people inside the cabin that the landing gear was operating correctly and that it had dispatched properly in order to be ready for landing. The co-pilot tries this again and the light still isn't working. So not wanting to put anyone in danger, they decide to talk to air traffic control, let them know that there was a problem and that they were gonna have to reattempt their landing. So with that, they make a U-turn in order to start descending all over again. So as they're heading back to the airport, they actually put the airplane on autopilot 
and Captain Robert Loft actually decided to climb down to the avionics bay. This is a space underneath the flight deck and the captain basically wanted to go see under there. It was almost like he was checking under the hood to see if there were any problems that he would be able to fix himself. Meanwhile, the rest of the people in the cockpit were still in there trying to figure out if there were any other sorts of problems arising from there. Now, in all planes, you know, there's a black box that records everything that's going on. And although I could not find the actual audio, there were transcripts of what happened. And out of nowhere, the co-pilot stock still says something that made people kind of start to worry. He says, we did something to the altitude. As they were landing, the plane should have been at approximately 2,000 feet up in the air, but they were actually dramatically lower to the ground. Followed by this, Captain Loft's voice is heard on the recorder. And he's recorded as asking, hey, what's going on up there? And essentially, that would be the last communication that was ever received from Flight 401. At 11.43 p.m., literally only three minutes after trouble had first started on the plane, another plane phoned into Miami Air Traffic Control to report an explosion. This, sadly, would end up being Flight 401 and they actually crashed into the Everglades at 227 miles per hour. What we would later find out is that the plane was so close to the water that the wing clipped the water and ended up cartwheeling multiple times into the swamp where it then exploded into the middle of these alligator infested Everglades. It ended up breaking into several pieces upon impact and then continued to actually travel in pieces for a third of a mile before it finally came to a rest. Surprisingly, the first on the scene was a local man named Robert Marquis. Now he was out on his little boat in the area and he was actually hunting for frogs. And when he had spoken to police and reporters later on, he said that while he was out in the Everglades, he noticed a big fireball and immediately he knew that this was a plane crash that he was witnessing. Immediately, he turns his boat and starts heading in the direction of the explosion followed by the Coast Guard. While it wasn't known right away how many survivors and how many deceased there were, there was one flight attendant that did survive and she was Beverly Raposa. She had actually been thrown far from the airplane into the mud, but she was alive. And by sheer will and just, you know, the dedication to survive and the desire to help people, she was able to get herself together to stand up and to start helping other people get out of the water onto the muddy surface where she was at. And from there, she started calling out to people who were further away, kind of guiding them in a way to get to her because it was a very disoriented situation. A lot of people still didn't know what was going on. So she figured that her voice would bring some sort of comfort to people, which it did because they ended up singing Christmas carols, her and the remaining survivors, in order to calm themselves down and to bring some sort of, you know, togetherness and create hope that they were going to be rescued. The remaining of the rescue would end up being extremely difficult to carry out. Not only was the swamp infested with alligators left and right, as soon as they could smell the blood and there was bodies everywhere in the swamp, alligators were coming out in droves, just biting onto bodies, not knowing if the body was dead or alive. There were dangerous snakes that were attacking rescuers. And of course, all the bacteria in the swamp was heavily infecting anybody who had an open wound. The Coast Guard eventually was able to arrive on the scene after they 
ended up following Mr. Marquis' light. So after the rescue, in total, 75 passengers and crew members survived. Eventually, the death toll would climb to 103 because a lot of people did end up dying in the hospital afterwards. Part of the people that ended up dying were the co-pilot Stockstill as well as Captain Loft who ended up dying in the wreckage. Repo had initially survived the initial crash but unfortunately he ended up dying in the hospital due to his injuries and technical officer Donato he actually ended up surviving along with two of the 10 air stewardesses at the time. So what happened? What could have possibly caused the plane that was literally minutes away from landing to completely go on a tailspin and crash and cause all of these deaths. So immediately an investigation was launched using the recordings from the black box. So it was discovered that the co-pilot Stockstill had placed the plane on autopilot after he was trying to figure out what was going on with the landing gear. The plane stayed on autopilot for approximately 80 seconds while he was doing this. After that, there was a sudden drop approximately 100 feet. And from there, the plane stayed on a steady trajectory for a little bit longer. However, the plane then started to descend so gradually that absolutely no one in the cockpit noticed. And by the time they did notice that something was wrong, which is assumed to be when the co-pilot said that they think they did something to the altitude, it was way too late. They had tried to pull the plane up as hard as they could as soon as they noticed that there was an issue. But unfortunately, they were just way too low to the ocean that the wing ended up clipping the water, which ended up resulting in this ginormous explosion and crash. Now, although there are safety parameters around warning, pilots that they're too close to the ground, investigators think that the pilots and everyone inside the cockpit were just way too distracted trying to figure out what was going on with the landing gear to notice this little chime that goes off as a warning when they are approaching ground or water way too closely. Now they had put the plane on autopilot which meant the plane should have stayed steady at the appropriate altitude. But after reviewing, the National Transportation Safety Board believes that while they were fumbling in the cockpit and trying to figure out what was going on with the landing gear, they think that one of the officers accidentally nudged the switch off of autopilot, which ended up causing the flight to start descending very, very slowly. And to make things worse, upon inspection of the plane, they ended up finding out that the landing gear was in complete working condition. There was absolutely nothing wrong with it. And the actual problem had been with the lights inside the cockpit. The two little light bulbs had burnt out, which made everyone inside the cockpit think that the landing gear was not working. When in reality, the light bulbs had just gone off and the landing gear had actually extended the way it should have. They just had no way of knowing it. Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit spooky. Almost immediately after the crash, witnesses started reporting strange lights coming from the Everglades, and they actually call these Marfa lights. They look like little orbs, little floating lights above the swamps. And this was just the beginning. So because the plane had left behind some reusable parts, a lot of these parts were returned to the manufacturer and actually reused on other L. 10, 11 planes. And within three months of the original crash, a lot of spooky stories started coming out from different members of Eastern Airlines. One of the most significant stories was of a pilot that was actually boarding a plane at JFK and he was getting his things together. He was getting ready to go into the plane and, you know, prepare for his flight. So he gets into the cockpit when he sees a man already sitting in there. So he starts talking to him thinking that he's just an added crew member because he was wearing a uniform. But in the middle of the conversation, he says that this man simply just vanished. Like he just disappeared into thin air. And this happened while he was talking to him face to face. 
So as you can imagine, this man was completely freaked out. He had no idea what was going on. And it said that he was so upset and almost traumatized at what had happened that the flight actually had to be canceled. On another occasion, there was a flight engineer that was working on one of the planes when he saw a man tell him that he had already done all the pre-flight checks. But before he could respond to this guy, the man ended up just completely vanishing in front of his eyes. And when he told someone about this and he gave the description of what the guy looked like, they were able to confirm that this was the apparition of Don Repo. On another flight from Atlanta to Miami, the cockpit crew was in the middle of their flight when they heard knocking coming from the avionics bay. Now, they were completely surprised to hear this because as far as they knew, no one should have been down there. So thinking someone snuck in when they weren't looking, they opened the door to hear the knocking and that's when they see the face of Don Repo looking back at them before he suddenly vanished. One of the more startling stories actually comes from a flight attendant on a flight from Mexico City to JFK. Now, as she was getting ready to, you know, do her thing, get the food, gather all the drinks and whatnot, she said she saw the reflection of a man in the oven. She would later recognize this as Don Repo's face. And right before he vanished, she heard him whisper into her ear to beware of fire. Right away, she obviously was quite startled, but she didn't know what to make of this message. So she carried on with her duties. And as the flight was taking off, surprisingly, the engine ended up catching fire. Thankfully, they were able to land the plane and go back to safety. But needless to say, that event completely left her startled and shocked at the omen that she had received. Within that year, there were approximately 20 reports of these ghosts from Flight 401 within Eastern Airlines. And it had become such a recurring thing for crew members to report these sightings that there was actually a report published the following year in the US Flight Safety Foundation newsletter. Now, not wanting for this situation to get out of hand, upper management at Eastern Airline started to tell employees to stop talking about these ghost stories. They actually went around and removed all of the logbooks that had these stories written in them. And they started threatening the employees that if they heard them talking about these stories or spreading these tales of ghosts, that their jobs would be at risk. And the stories had gotten so far out of hand that the CEO of Eastern Airlines went on to call them garbage in a book that he published soon after. And on top of that, he actually also ended up refuting the claims that any spare parts from the wreckage were being reused in new planes. This message was then echoed by the public relations manager of Eastern Airlines. And he basically went on to repeat the same thing as the CEO, that all of these stories were complete garbage, that they were all nonsense, and he went on to reaffirm that no spare parts from Flight 401 were being used in any other planes at Easter Airlines. However, if you ask the son of Don Repo, he has a very different belief about the entire situation. He actually was celebrating his wedding and him and his wife had booked a hotel and they hadn't told anyone where they were staying. Then later on in the evening when him and his wife returned, and were ready to go to bed, they actually walked into their hotel room to find a little wing of Eastern Airlines, you know, like the little pins they get. Well, he said he found one of these in his hotel room. And to him, there was no other way to take this as a sign from the supernatural. Most of the sightings actually died down by 1974. And it's hard to find any other stories that come directly from that era. However, I did come across another story that was quite recent. It actually happened in 2020. Now, this comes from a story from a man named Chris, and he was on a flight from Chicago to Miami, and he was heading down to the beach city to pay respects to his grandmother because she had recently passed away. He didn't specify which airline this was on, but he did say it was a Boeing 737. Now, this was an overnight flight. He did say there were not a lot of people on the flight. There were probably 
about 50 people or so, enough for him to familiarize himself with a handful of the faces on board, as well as for people not to have someone sitting next to them throughout the flight. So the way he was sitting was that he had a window seat. There was no one next to him in the seat next to him. Then there was an aisle and then there was another seat next to the aisle, followed by a seat next to the opposing window. And in that seat next to the opposing window across the aisle was an older lady and he said that she was sitting reading a book. Around 5 a.m., he had woken up and he checked the screen on the seat in front of him to see where they were. And that's when he noticed that they were approaching the Everglade area. He also said that because it was super early, the flight was quite quiet at that time and the lights were turned down very low in order to let the passengers sleep. So he wanted to take advantage of this and decided to close his eyes for a little bit longer in order to catch some more Z's. And then that's when he felt something happen. He said he felt someone come and sit right next to him. And he thought this was very, very odd because the energy he felt came on quite suddenly. And I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this energy when you're in a room and you can just feel that someone walks in or when you feel someone staring at you from across the room. It was the same type of thing for him. So he opens his eyes and to surprise, he sees a man sitting next to him in the empty seat. Now he said this man was about maybe in his late 40s, early 50s, and he also had some sort of uniform on. It quickly clicked for Chris that this guy must have been a pilot or some sort of co-pilot, something to do with the airline. And he confirmed this because when he looked at the guy's hat, there was a logo on it that said Eastern Airlines. Not really wanting to be rude to this guy, he says hello to him and the guy just nods back at him. He didn't say anything. But instead, the guy actually leans over, looking across Chris and looking outside the window. And as he does this, that's when Chris notices the little pin badge on the guy's jacket that had a name on it. And that name was Robert Loft. Not fully understanding the circumstances at this time, Chris kind of just, you know, acknowledges the name on the badge and he turns and also looks out the window to see what the guy was looking at. But of course, it was still super dark outside, so all they could see was just pure blackness as they were flying over the Everglades. So he turns back around and looks at the seat and to surprise, the guy is completely gone. And what freaks him out is that he didn't feel the guy get up. I'm sure you guys know that when you're on a plane and someone gets up, you can definitely feel the movement of the chair, especially if they're sitting right next to you. So this freaks him out. He stands up. He undoes his seatbelt. He stands up. He looks around the airplane, just trying to see if he could find where this guy went. He had zero luck locating this guy, but he did notice something else where the woman with the book was sitting next to the opposing window was now someone completely different. It was another guy also in an Eastern Airlines uniform and the guy was actually staring at Chris. Chris was looking a little bit uncomfortable. You know, he seemed completely confused, a little bit frantic about where this guy that was sitting next to him had just gone. And it seemed like the guy in the opposite side noticed that he looked confused. So he introduces himself and he says, hi, I'm Don. Do you need help with something? And so Chris kind of shook about what's happening, just tells him no. And he sits back down, puts his seatbelt back on. But by the time he looks over to see the guy again, the other guy is gone as well, and in his place is the original woman he had seen at the beginning of his flight. For months and months and months, he tried to block out the events that happened that night, or at least try to come up with some sort of explanation to help him calm down, but he couldn't. So in order to kind of, you know, explain this to himself, because he definitely wasn't going around telling anyone, he didn't want anyone to think he was crazy, so he starts doing research and that's when he comes across other similar stories of people experiencing these hauntings, especially as they're flying over the Everglades. And as he dug a little bit deeper, that's when he came across the story of Flight 401. And 
of course, as he's reading and he's familiarizing himself with the details of the story, it clicks for him that the people he saw on the flight that day, Robert Loft and Don, were the pilots and one of the engineers on the flight that day. And that's when it clicked for him that essentially he had seen the ghosts of the people that had died on flight 401. And that's where the story ends. So what do you guys think? Do you guys think that the airline was actually using pieces from the crash to, you know, repurpose them for other flights? Do you think they were lying to the public in order to save face? Do you think people are just seeing things and trying to, you know, create a story out of a tragic incident? Have you ever been on a flight? Like, let me know if you guys have ever been on one of these flights and have experienced something strange, especially as you're flying over the Everglades. I would be super curious to know about that. I'm going to wrap up the video there for this week. But if you guys have any other video suggestions, also leave them in the comments below. I am thinking about doing something more haunting or more paranormal oriented for October. So if that's something you guys are interested, also let me know below. All right. Thank you guys for joining me and I will see you in the next video.